So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Democratic Representative Deb Colstey of Janesville has decided that four terms in the State Assembly representing the 44th District is enough. So I'm very grateful. Wisconsin, I thank you for that exit interview. You're so welcome. Thank you for wanting to do it. Well, uh, eight years. Um, high points, low points, frustrations? The high point is that as a Democrat in the minority, I got quite a few um, health care bills passed. So that's always a high point when you sit in in the minority. Um, my experience, I love to learn, so I think this building has given me more opportunities to learn so much, and actually that's the part I'm going to miss the most. I just told you, I just came back from there um, talking about COVID-19, the coronavirus, yes. and they're having a briefing on that. Um, we had a briefing last week on vaccines. Every, every day in this building I can learn something new, if not from a formal setting, from people just coming in my office in telling me their points of view or they're giving me their knowledge. So I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss the young people that are in this building. Um, it's, it, is, it is a fascinating place to work. I enjoy the spirit they bring and the knowledge they bring and, and the youth they bring. So I'm, I'm going to miss the, the young people who work around here and I'm, I'm going to miss the majority of my colleagues. Um, so there are things I'm going to miss, what I won't miss is politics. Okay, but you did, are you saying that when you ran, you underestimated the amount of raw partisan politics in this building? Were you a little bit naive? I, well, I was extremely naive, to you were. be honest with you. So um, I will let you know I came from um, rural Nebraska and then moved from rural Kansas. And um, so my life has been always I guess bipartisan, but I would say it was nonpartisan. Um, you know, we didn't talk politics when I was younger, and um, when I was early age, raising my children. Um, when you live in a area where they vote only 13 percent for Hillary Clinton, there's not a lot of um, political diversity. In Nebraska. In Kansas. Uh, uh, in Kansas, excuse me. So, um, so I was just always the devil's advocate. You know, I was just always taking the counterpoint of view. So it was actually when we moved to Wisconsin that I realized that I was taking a counterpoint of view because I just had philosophical differences with the people that I loved dearly back in Kansas and Nebraska. So um, moving up here, I, I really I think I was naive about um, just how politics. And when I'm talking about politics, I'm not just talking about a point, different point of view on a, on a policy matter. Mm -hmm. I expect there to be differences on that. Like, for instance, the other day when we were talking on the floor about how to spend the surplus. Yes. I expect that kind of dialogue to happen on the floor. Right. But it's when it's just a politics of power, for power's sake only, I, I wasn't prepared for that. Do you remember the first time in your first term that you really, any antidote you want to tell about um, how you learned just how partisan this building is? Was um, it on a specific bill? Did you try to sponsor something only to be told, excuse me, you're in the minority? Well, every bill that I've written, I've had to give to a Republican if I wanted it to pass. And most of the bills I write, I wanted to pass. Um, so Im immediately I knew that that part of partisanship was here. And um, that was just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, the real culminating factor um, was what happened with Representative Jimmy Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the majority party had the ability to take away anything they wanted from the, the minority party as far as presenting bills or um, pulling motions and those kind of things and to implicate him in the struggle was there was just kind of a culminating that that's not the kind of politics I liked. Was that issue the specifically uh, denying him the ability to participate in a committee uh, hearing by phone? 
which well, is allowed in the Senate, or what specific? Well, more specifically is that they put the accommodations in a bill that would strip the minority party of some of its rights that it had in the past. And um, they could have taken those things away from us without implicating him in the conversation at all. They could have given him his accommodations and still taken away our rights to pull bills and do things like that. They didn't have to implicate him in by putting his um, accommodations in that bill. Was that when you said, I think I'm going to move on and leave the State Assembly? Um, it, I mean, I've always thought I was a little bit of a misfit just because I wasn't, because I didn't understand politics probably quite that well. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, certainly was, that was a, that was a bad evening. Who do you blame for that? Um, I blame, blame the, the group thing that says that more power is more important than, than, than discussion and, and humanity. And I just don't think that we need, any one group of people needs more and more power. I just, I honestly don't think any of us think that, that the world should be ruled by one group of people. I mean, there's just such diversity in the state, um, economically, um, eth you know, ethnic backgrounds, etc. I just think we, um, I think there should always be discussion. And the more you take, the more power you have, the more you seem to want to take away from the minority's power. And that part of politics, I, I guess I don't understand. You've been a part of a lot of closed caucuses. You've seen some of your younger members. They're very talented, talented. they work very hard. But when they come up against a move like the Republicans to tie the Jimmy Anderson accommodation bill to these other more punitive changes, don't you think if your party controlled the Senate, some of them would want to do the same? That's my worst fear. Okay. That's my worst fear. Um, actually, I'm a proponent of open caucuses. I've been on, I don't think we had it this time, but I've signed on every time there was an open caucus bill. I just think that by this time, if, if you're in the legislature, you're adult enough to have a conversation in public if you're talking about bills, public bills. So um, I'm a, it's kind of hard to understand how it all would work logistically, but um, I, I just think it's time we have, I think people would be better off if we had open caucuses. You, you, you are perceived as being pretty effective in the legislative process. Which bill did you have to go to a Republican to, to lead sponsor what are you most proud of? One well, or two? Um, so there have been several. You know, the very first bill I did was with Amy Loudenbeck. Um, we also did the telehealth bill together. Um, I wrote a bill about um, the PDMP and making sure that um, physicians are notified if opiates are abu being abused, right. prescription opiates were being abused. And I took that to John, and um, he became the author, and then we got it passed. But he was always willing to say that it was my bill. Um, mm -hmm. We. Um, the PBM bill um, should absolutely pass the Senate. I don't know, you know, there's said there's a lot of negotiation on to make sure that it passed, and I'm thinking we have either 100 or 102 co-sponsors, which is a super majority in both houses. Right. So who are you negotiating with? You worked on that bill for years. Yes, three, about three years. Is that really going to lower drug prices? Because it's a very complex relationship because f between pharmacy benefit managers. and. Not many people in the 44th district understand it. Is it really going to lower drug prices? That, you know, I actually can't say that. It might, in, individually, it might, just removing the gag clause. And, yes, um, okay. I just brought a, so my husband's a physician, and he gets a Journal of American Medicine, Medicine at our home, and I just brought it to the office yesterday, and it talks about high pharmaceutical prices. And the the absolute opacity of PBMs with pharmaceuticals and insurance companies is creating a monster that, if we don't get our hands on it pretty soon, um, they're in total control of what pharmaceuticals cost now, and they're, they're part of the mix. So I, I, think, I think it will help. I think any time we can add, the bill does add some transparency, and I think transparency is the only cure for what ails the healthcare system. You were trained as a medical technologist, which means a, a lab, a, a lab right, uh, I professional? Work, I work in a lab, correct, or I did for many, many, many years. What about, uh, I'm really curious, you're 
the debate nationally, uh, Medicare for all, Mr. Sanders, public option, Mr. Biden, what would be the best reform for the nation? So what would be the best or what do I think can happen? Both. I think- Wave a wand and come up with best. So you're getting into a conversation I had with my young, younger daughter yesterday. Um, because she thinks that we should disrupt the system now and take care of everybody, and I, I wish that were possible. I think getting a public option and making sure that people have access to insurance, but more importantly, I think we need to get a cut. So this, had I stayed, this is when something I would have been working on, is trying to get a, a hold of what pricing is like in the state. I think um, there are some states that are trying to hold a, a, a cut, you know, kind of a pricing cap or at least looking at where the pricing is coming from um, versus costs, because we have no idea what costs are, because it's such a confusing conglomeration of people with their fingers in this. All I know is that medicine is always very adept at finding a new way to make more money. And that's where I put um, PBMs in. They're just another mechanism. Um, they're the fastest growing part of medicine. so. I just think we need transparency, but we need to be able to get people um, into the ability, to, at least the ability to see a doctor. Um, a long time ago, my husband and I went to um, a conference, on, a family medicine conference, a national conference, and they were talking about different systems. And they were talking about Portugal, and Portugal um, had horrible statistics, morbidity and mortality rates. They put a comprehensive primary care clinic in every neighborhood, and the changes were just were amazing. You know, the morbidity and mortality rates changed so dramatically. They're, and so I just looked up the other day, and they're still um, their healthcare system is more thriving than ours is right now when it comes to um, outcomes for people. Well, um, I'm fascinated by your expertise, and, and your husband is a physician. Looking back over your eight years. Are there more residents of Janesville without insurance or more burdened by health care costs than when you first came into office? More Janesville residents worse off for health care um, because of all these And I don't changes. know the, ex, the actual statistics, but I will say when I first started office, or just before, we still had GM employees yes. or retirees or people that were you know, being laid off by GM, but they still had GM insurance. Yes. And right now we've replaced that with um, a diversity of different manufacturers and businesses, but I'm not sure that all of them provide the kind of comprehensive care that GM provided for their um, okay. employees. Actually, we were just talking about the book, Janesville by Amy Goldstein. And in it, so I, I'm in a very bipartisan book club actually, Brian Stiles' mother is in my book club, and we all love each other. What are you now reading? Um, the Book Woman for Troublesome Creek, okay. and it is a really, it's a good story. It's a good storyteller. Um, but anyway, in Amy Goldstein's book, we had a discussion at my book club because we read it, and everybody thinks that Janesville is doing better now than during the height of the recession, which is true. But when you look at our poverty statistics through the school district, that doesn't hold up. So I think that we have more people employed because our unemployment is low. But um, we're replacing better paying jobs with um, more menial, um, lower paying jobs. And so I, I think that's probably reflected in the ability of people to see um, physicians. Um, I do know that more people probably do have some sort of insurance mm -hmm. because I've also been involved with HealthNet and I know that some of their um, clientele has changed and, and the dental part of the HealthNet is becoming way more active. Um, but I think people probably now have more insurance but probably believe that with higher deductibles and um, co-pays. I'm just fascinated by the issue of health care, which you have some amount of expertise in. I'm, I'm also fascinated because during the eight years that you've been in the assembly, nationally, we have seen a decline in life expectancy because of so-called deaths of despair. 
drug abuse, drug addiction, suicide, and um, alcoholism that, that damages livers, which kills people. What's your thoughts on why America has experienced these deaths of, of despair that have shortened life expectancies for many Americans? Well, you know, part of it was after recession, there was just the hangover from um, lack of financial security, et cetera. Um, it, we just seem to be more polarized. I, I don't know. It just, it's, it is tragic. I mean, I said on <clears throat> almost anything that happens with healthcare, I seem to be on the panel. So I said yeah. on the, the, the You were on the suicide prevention. Right, and the Alzheimer's task force. Yes. And um, I said on the substance abuse committee, and I've been very involved in the, the opiate bills. You know, I, I don't know. Part of, part of the drug, I, we could spend a whole hour talking about how yes. we got into this opiate crisis and that significantly lowered lifespans just because so many young people were dying from overdose, overdoses and not just people that used to be on heroin um, kind of could regulate how they took heroin to make sure they didn't die and people die now because we have the ability to get things like fentanyl that you know are just too strong for the body to handle. Yeah. So I, um, I don't know why there is despair. I mean, you would think that in a time when there's supposed economic um, boom, that we would see less of that. I, I just think we became in a cycle after the recession, and then we fed ourselves, the country fed itself on a, um, with healthcare on getting opiates to more people. Um, so I don't know. I, and when we look at the suicide rate that's gone up so substantially, um, I How think sometimes people, so we own a farm, I don't know if you knew this, but we own a farm out in Kansas that um, we operate. And for farmers, I, I absolutely understand the, there's just no power to control what the pricing of commodities are going to be. Yes. I mean, you have to be ever vigilant in, you know, you, one day you're um, thinking, oh, I should be selling my corn pretty soon, and then the next day it's, you know, we have that tariff and, and the bottom falls out of the market, so. Does, does the political <coughs> process in this capital, how well does it respond to some of these health care issues? Um, does so it I, get it? So I said on a, a panel um, a couple of days ago for the La Follette School on Public Policy, and it was on health care. And um, somebody said, how do we get the attention of the legislature? And I, I think sometimes it has to re reach a critical mass that it affects, affects more people in the legislature. And then I think they see the importance of it more. Um, and maybe that's the way all things Have you work. seen more interest in health care issues over the eight years you've been in the assembly? I mean, I'm so involved in it. It's true. I, you know, I like to think that people are following along, but I, I think it's my own great interest in all things health. How bad is the achievement gap in Janesville schools, Deb? Um, I think right now that all of Janesville schools are struggling a little bit because the poverty rate has gone up so significantly in all the schools. Um, so we, we have a couple schools. It, it's still a pretty small community. So yeah. we have a couple schools that have higher poverty and in, in, in the, in the achievement gap there. I think the biggest achievement gap is just, is just because of poverty. Um, we don't have a real significant portion of um, minority students there, but our, our, poverty is, our poverty is high. Well, last week, Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald said that the governor, as a former superintendent of public instruction, only knows one solution. More money for schools, more money for K-12, more money for K-12. Um, is that really going to help the, uh, close the achievement gap in Janesville? So I am a proponent of public schools. Yes. I just am. I am. I think that that's what changed and made America different than other countries. Is that we have public education. Everybody had the same foothold on the ladder until 
you know, poverty is always overriding. But I think, I do think the more we ask teachers to take home less than I make in this building and work hard and lots of hours and have lots of problems at school. And um, I, think, I think we don't put enough money in public education. I think it should be our number one. So when we were, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> when we were having that argument the other day on the floor, or that discussion, I should say, yes. on the floor about how do we spend the surplus, in another bill, we are also looking at should we incarcerate more people to the tune of about a billion dollars? The, the well, tougher on crime package. Yeah. Yes. So we can spend more on education, that surplus, or we can spend it on incarceration of more people. And I, I think, I, I just believe in public education. I just do. I think. I think it's what made our country different. I think it's, after the war, we know that's what changed the trajectory of, after World War II, the change the trajectory of this country when GIs could further their education the on GI the GI Bill. Bill. Yeah, go back to school and buy homes. and. So will it change in the, in the near term, the poverty gap? I don't, I don't know that. But in the long run, I, I, have, I have faith in education. There seems to be a well-traveled brick on the desk in your <laughs> office. What's the story behind the brick? So this is a GM brick. Oh, it is. So um, actually, the GM site is an opportunity zone, which the governor just signed to get some more money for the opportunity zones. And um, when they tore it down, um, they distributed. And it was amazing how many people came from literally so many states to just get a part of the of the history of uh, the GM. I mean, it was over 100 years old. They'd made lots of automobiles there and actually lots of tractors. So anyway, that is a GM brick. Very appropriate coming from the representative from Janesville. So why did you decide to get out? You mentioned the disappointment when the Republicans tacked on all that to the, to the Jimmy Anderson accommodation. And because I have three grandchildren, I'm not probably going to get to the nine that you have, but the three grandchildren I have, I, I would like to spend more time with them. They're one, three, and just turned six, um, and they're adorable. And um, I have a mother that in, um, out in western Nebraska that um, her caretaker, you know, the person that yes. makes sure she has her medications is my sister. And my sister's been ill for a while. And um, I just, I need to get out there. My husband was out there four times to my one, and it's, I understand. it's time to get out there. So when your six-year-old grandchild says, Grammy, what do you do in this beautiful building? How do you, how, what's the short answer? What's the elevator? Well, she already knows the answer. I chit-chat. <laughs> um, no, she, actually, I think she probably, she knows that I come here and, and talk to people. Because that's what I say I do. And... That talking to people is my education, and hopefully it in, kind of informs what I do when I write bills. And, and obviously my background has informed that a, a great deal. So yesterday was Super Tuesday. <coughs> Who do you support as a Democratic nominee? Well, we had a big discussion in the car with my teacher daughter, and um, I, I'm not going to say because I once... I will say something very political right now. Okay. I want somebody who would, will beat the current president. Um, what um, that implies that the current president has and his policies have taken a toll on America. Can you elaborate? Um, I think that when you, I think it has created. I hate the dialogue that comes out of there. I. I always think that people should talk at a higher level and with more s sympathy for who they're talking to, even if they disagree with them, have at least some sort of sympathetic knowledge of what they're going through. And um, I don't, I hate the way the discussions at that level go. It, it just, I don't believe anybody thinks that that's the way a, a good society acts. What's your greatest fear if President Trump is reelected? What does America look like in 2024? as he would end a second term? I don't know. I just think we keep going down this road of, of greater um, animosity. And um, I don't know. I just, 
I just think that we don't talk politely to one another. I hope that when I've been in this building that I've been polite with my um, people on the other side of the aisle. And I think I have actually, when I gave my going away speech, I was very heartened to see that we stopped the process and everybody came across to say thank you and, and give me a hug. So especially Joe Sanfilippo and I would be remiss if I didn't say I had really, really enjoyed working on the health committee. And um, Joe and I had a really good working relationship and I will miss that a lot. Working relationship, but you had a, more than a few disagreements, correct? Oh, absolutely. On, po on policy. Absolutely. And, um, but I think he feels the same way that we, it, the discourse is good. Um, just don't make it personal and, and cranky. So a few years from now, one of your grandchildren says, I think I might like to run for the assembly. What's your advice, Grandma? My advice would be live in your community first. Yeah. I mean, I knew, somebody asked me one time if I wanted to run for the Senate, and I go, oh, I know jo Janesville. I like Janesville. I want to represent Janesville. Um, just know your community. It's, um, I like living in Janesville. I, I like being on the school board. Um, just know your community and, um, and, and have sympathy for whoever you're talking with to some degree. If you don't know their side of the story, you'll just become more strident in your, view, in your views. So, um, Is the fact that Republicans are likely to control the assembly in the next session a factor in why you're retiring? I, I don't think so, because I, no. no, I haven't known anything else. Um, you know, the Jimmy factor, I don't know how much it would have played in. It was just one of the most disappointing moments in the building, but I'm not sure that, that it um, was the defining moment of, of departure. Um, as you said, there's a COVID-19 briefing going on, and when we end, you may go back to it. I will be. <laughs> um, how severe of a threat does it pose to Wisconsin residents? I think the <clears throat> Pardon me. The biggest concern is that we don't know. Um, the fact that it, the, you know, the R naught or the RO factor, how effective it is, is that it seems to be climbing. At first, they thought it was two, and now it's almost up to four. And that's, and that's the death rate. Yes. No, that's that's the rate at which it is. Um, oh, multiplies. Right. Thanks for the correction. So, so um, the influenza is like one point three. So. One person with flu, maybe one to one point three people. Multiply. Yeah. Yeah, the multiply. And, and, and that number is going up. And also, um, the concern that it, how virulent it is, how the morbidity, of, I mean, the mortality rate is, seems to be concerning. And right now, we don't have enough test kits um, to make sure that we're catching people so they aren't going out and spreading it. Um, but the good news is most people, just like if they have the flu or anything else, just get better. It's, the concern is for the people that um, are more frail. So I think the big concern now is we just don't know. So, and I think, I assume that's what they're saying. If there is, be cautious, and don't be panicky, be ca but be cautious and um, make sure you all, all always use good hygiene. So. You're leaving with uh, elbow bumps. Oh, elbow yeah. bumps and we better not shake hands. We better uh, elbow out. Um, um, you're leaving a, a district that's been considered safe for, for Democrats. You're well aware of the five or six or nine districts that are very competitive. There's a lot of money that's going to be spent in districts that are competitive. If you could wave a wand, how would you get the large amounts of money out of politics? If I could wave a wand, I would do away with gerrymander. Okay. Um, I think that is a... I think money is a big threat, but I also think that um, the fact that they can spend a lot of money in, in just a few districts is because we have a gerrymander. I do not understand that at all. Um, our fr good friend Tim Cullen has been so active on working on that. The fact that um, we only have a few districts that are competitive Yes. should be concerning the fact that Democrats had almost a, what, a quarter million votes in the last election, but we're still in the minority, um, 63 to 36. 
I think that's concerning. Does, is that going to change in three years since you'll have a Democratic governor who would veto a uh, reapportionment plan enacted by the uh, GOP? And so I don't know how, I don't know how all that'll shake out. I would hope okay. so. Okay. But I don't, we'll wait and see. Two final questions. What is your advice to your successor? Um, so they'll come in with a different set of knowledge about our community than I have, whoever it is. Um, I don't, unless they're, in, you know, in the medical field. Um, just be attuned to what is good for Janesville and use common sense and actually listen. Again, I say this, listen to everybody that comes in, even if you think you know better and disagree with them vehemently. There is something to be learned from everybody. How, are you, how would you advise them to work with a potential Republican majority again? They'll work with them. Um, I, as you mentioned, I've had quite a few bills passed because I'm willing to work with them, but I thought they were, I'm willing to do that and just not go around making political statements because I think it's important to work on policy in this building. Then final question, are you really done with politics? Are we going to see your name? In connection with anything? I, I wouldn't ever say never. I, I don't know that I would run for a partisan office again. Um, if I do, it would be something in, in my community. You wouldn't run for partisan office again because? Because um, it just probably isn't a fit. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Representative Deb Colsty represents the 44th District. After four terms, she's retiring. She and her husband live in Janesville. Good luck. Thank you, Steve. Are we supposed Appreciate to handshake it. or bump? Bump? Fist okay. Bump. Good luck and thank you very much. You bet. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 